rise up, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, I'm probably used to mic for the live stream, thanks. But everybody can hear me fine, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you to Sweetwater for having me to this. This is a very cool space, as I'm sure everybody's walked around and checked out. This facility is pretty amazing. Um, so today, I wanted to talk about a couple things because it's only it's a little less than an hour, so I'm going to try to cover a lot because I tend to get sidetracked very quickly. So at the very end, I'll leave about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has questions on anything. I'm going to go over some slight tuning stuff. A lot of people ask me how I get that bass drum sound that's open and kind of big. I literally have done almost nothing to this bass drum, so if that tells you anything. There's nothing in it. I kind of detuned one lug. We'll get into some of that stuff, but it sounds unbelievable. <laughs> Pretty sweet. Um, and I'm going to play to like one track. Uh, that's going to lead into, if, if you guys pay attention, guys and gals, pay attention to some of the stickings I'm using. They're very simple, but I want to kind of try to give everybody a couple of things to maybe take home. Who, raise your hand if you're a drummer. Yes, very good, awesome. And if you're not, if you're a bass player or a piano player, maybe some of this stuff will translate to other instruments. But I want to take simple ideas like a double stroke roll, single stroke roll, things that are pretty easy to comprehend and just augment them a little bit so you can get different ideas. And it, it, it relates to the book I just put out, which I'm going to be doing a signing afterwards over by the Ludwig booth uh, with Hal Leonard. It's called Concepts and Creativity. And it's basically taking simple ideas and applying them in a little bit of a different way on the kit to sound really different. Does that make sense? Simple? Um, so this first tune, this might be the only tune I do. Um, this first tune is, uh, so I play with this guy, Charlie Hunter, sometimes. He's a, does anybody know who Charlie Hunter is? Yeah. All right, he's pretty good. Um, he plays the bass and the guitar at the same time, somehow. I've stared at him for a couple years on stage, and I still don't know how he does it. Um, but this is actually a record we did. We put out a few copies. Um, and if you're interested, I actually have some at home. I, could, I can mail you if you want to get one. Um, with this amazing singer named Silvana Estrada from uh, Mexico. She lives, I think she actually lives in Mexico City uh, now. She moved. She used to live up in the hills. She's an amazing singer. You'll hear her voice in a second. And we did this record at my house in a little bedroom. Just me, Charlie was playing bass and guitar. She was playing this instrument called the quattro. Ridiculous player, amazing time while she's singing. Um, and this was just one of my, my, probably my favorite song off the record. It's, just got, it's not crazy drumming, but it's, it's about what I'm playing. And I'll talk about the part after and show different things I could have played and why I chose to play this part. Okay, cool. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
profundos porque el cielo no ha sabido comprender que se mueve la distancia y los asuntos que contemplo sin poderlos resolver Thank you. So I had to let that play out at the end. I know there's no drums in the beginning and the end, but it's a nice tune, so you gotta just listen. And that's something I'm actually gonna talk about in a second is how little people these days I've noticed are talking about listening. And it's, you know, I get it, it's gear fest. I will talk about all the gear I have up here and microphones and everything. But at the end of the day, you could have all the greatest gear in the world, and if you're not actually listening to people you're playing with, like your singer or your bass player or your mandolin player or whoever you're playing with, all of that stuff is completely irrelevant. So listening chops to me are something that I hope, I hope that becomes something that's like sought after as opposed to you know, sitting here and being able to just go like <laughs> for 20 minutes. Um, that's great. It's good to be able to have that in your bag and everything. But I don't know if I even use any of that when I play with Charlie. Maybe I'll use like a buzz roll. That to me is a lot more useful and more musical. So let's get back to this tune real quick before I go off on some 20 minute tangent. Um, does any, did anybody notice like a main pattern I was playing on the groove? Did anybody catch like, yeah. Similar, but yeah, yes, you are right. A plus, yes. Uh, did you see the sticking? Really simple. Anyone? My man. What's your name? Austin. A plus. Nice work. Um, so yeah, so that is like a really simple sticking that's in my book. So in the book, there's three stickings: single stroke roll. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard of that one. Double stroke roll. Probably everybody's got that one. And right, left, left. Anybody in here lefty? All right, so just reverse all the stickings in the book. <laughs> or do both. <laughs> do both. I haven't gone through the book left yet. I, I'm, it's hard enough writing. Um, so that groove, so I could have played a, a lot of different things on that tune, right? And I also chose these for a textural thing, right? These are uh, all very cool. They're by this guy, Dave Deming. They're called Dem Sticks. And he makes a bunch of different bundles, and they just have an amazing sound kind of on anything they sound pretty cool. But I could have done the classic, like... That's fine, too. It would sound great. She sounds amazing singing. So, like, I, I don't need to do a lot when you're playing with somebody who's that good. You just kind of want to get out of their way, or at least I do, so I can hear what they're doing, right? So, to me, it was a little too open. And I, I was kind of hearing that shuffly, you know... It's just got a little bit more motion to it. Does everybody agree? Cool. So, I'll do it with these. So it's just right, left, left. I'm sure a lot of people play this. And I also picked kind of a dead snare. It's absolutely filthy sounding, which I like. So getting that. That makes sense, right? If I do it very just straight up. Right hand crosses over, kind of straight up. Does everybody follow? That's easy, right? Cool. Now what can get tricky, and I actually use this groove in Lion King, in a, what was a... It's actually a little bit less hip than that at Lion King. But um, so accenting that second note of a double for whatever reason trips a lot of people up when I'm teaching, and that's kind of why I ended up doing this book. Hal Leonard approached me to do this, and I said, "Sure, I think I have enough to fill up a book." And so 
I started breaking down these exercises that I started doing a while ago to teach students their left hands were typically, you know, your right hand in general can play a, like, you know, 16th note thing. <laughs> Right? But let's say you wanted to move that 16th note pulse somewhere else, getting away from the hi hat. What would, what, what's an option that you could do with your left hand? It's a great idea, everybody. So play the 16th on your left hand, right? So. So it's kind of like you get this vibe behind. Make sense? Cool. So again, I'm not trying to do this stuff to be like just show off technique or something. To me, when I started doing that groove, I wanted to hear that sound under something like this. And I was kind of sick of doing... So this is the first... And would it be helpful if I took this rack tom off so people could see? Or is everybody cool? It's cool, great. That's easier for me. Um, so this is like the first kind of exercise. I want to kind of give everybody a couple little tidbits out of the book and you can kind of see where it goes. Um, and it gets pretty hard towards the end. When I wrote it, I was trying to push myself as far as I could kind of go where I'd have to work on it for about a day and then I would get it. And then after that I said, okay, this is gonna be hard enough. Um, so I'll try to play some of this stuff from the end, but it's, it's tough, Let's see if I can do it. So this first exercise is very, it's kind of what I just explained. Playing 16th note funk kind of thing, rock thing, whatever. <laughs> Start there, everybody can probably do that. Then you double, actually no, we go to the eighth note on the hi-hat, so. But you fill it in with sixteenths on your left hand. Does that make sense? Then the next thing, double it, so. That's a really good exercise, and it also, when you're doing that, right, so you're basically playing together, which is kind of tough, because you guys, guys and gals are always, you're training your hands to play opposite all the time. Everybody wants that, right? So when you switch it and go to this, your tendency is to go, you get in that zone really quickly, and I still do, depending on what time of day I'm practicing this stuff. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, we can move on from that one? Cool, because so I've got a lot to talk about. Um, so the next thing from that is this, basically the general concept. Has anybody gotten the book yet? I hand mailed a couple, like a hundred of them. My man's got it, all right. So this is kind of a nutshell of what the book dives into. It's, and it's taking those three stickings, what were they? Single stroke roll, double stroke roll, right, left, left. Two lefts. So taking those three stickings, okay, and playing a pulse. So let's just do a pulse first. Uh, can everybody see my hands? Yeah? Let's take this off just for fun. So let's just do this. So that in itself is actually very hard to do, right? So if you're here. Going between those, I still work on that all the time. The transition is really hard. I mean, you have like a fraction of a millisecond to basically switch depending on what tempo you're doing. So all of these little lessons have like mini lessons in them if you look at them from different angles. You know what I mean? So you can kind of tweak all of these things and, and really work on stuff. So let's just take those three stickings. I'm gonna just do a pulse with no accents and go, go through them, right? It should all just sound exactly the same.
But naturally, when you're playing a right, left, left, you immediately, your ear, even though I'm trying to play it as clean as possible, kind of goes to that triplet vibe. Does everybody hear that? And it's probably because of where I'm hitting. It's tough going between those. So I was like, all right, I need to make this as seamless as I can, but I need to work on accents through these things. So the first basic system is no feet, just hands, okay? And you basically start, I start at three as an accent, because if you accent every note, if you do one, let's say, everything's just loud. You follow what I'm saying? If I, you know, two would be three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The nice thing is at the end of this whole thing, eight is your friend. You're like, cool. It's just, and also four, there are these little segues like, when you hit six, you get kind of into the six, eight thing. So there's little happy places. Five, seven, three, it's probably where everybody's gonna get upset. So does everything make sense so far? No questions, great. So let's take, uh, somebody shout out a number between three and eight. Nine is not between three and eight. Uh, I heard seven first. Thanks so much, that's the hardest one. So I'll do it on the hi-hat, I guess. So let's just do singles and doubles, going between those two. And this is how I would recommend if you do want to do this book. It's nice because you can chip away at it very slowly and you get these little rewards very kind of quickly. It's not like some books I see and you dive in and immediately it's like absolutely overwhelming. And that's for this book, I didn't want it to be completely bananas. I wanted it to be very tangible for even if you've been playing for a year, you can dive in and do the first probably five pages. Okay, so I'm gonna do seven, so singles, right? One, two, three, four, five. And I'm also not thinking about like, oh, I'm playing in seven, eight, right? I'm not going like. I'm not thinking of it that way at all. This is like an exercise to get, the whole point of this book is to get your ears your hands and your musicality to a point where you can play whatever you're thinking. I'm sure everyone in here can sing me some really cool groove, some really cool fills, and then I go, oh, okay, cool, play it on the drums. And then, then it starts to fall apart very quickly. So I want everyone's hands, the purpose of this book is to get, every sorry, I'm totally talking to this side of the room, and then it's the angle with the mic. There we go, centered. Hello, everybody. So. Does that make sense to kind of how this all ties together? It's basically getting your technique together. It's getting your ears better because you start hearing patterns and you know, most people aren't sitting around playing double circles, accenting every fifth note. Um, or then you switch to the right, left, left. And so that's basically like a simple exercise. Let's do five just because it's easier than seven. But I could do seven. We'll do seven. everybody see that? It should sound, everyone's like, oh, it sounds the same. That's the exact point, that it should sound exactly the same when you're switching between stickings. So then each sticking and number has its own kind of puzzle to figure out. Does that make sense? The whole thing kind of is like a Rubik's Cube. And once you figure out, oh, when I do a double stroke roll and it's an odd number, it's going to cycle through each sticking. So the whole point of this is to make your second strokes accessible so you're not bouncing and hoping for the best. Because I see a lot of the bouncy stuff, which is fine. But if you want to play like, and like go between a floor tom and a cymbal, if you're bouncing that, it's not happening. So it gives you like control over every note that you're playing, if that makes sense. You're not. So I don't bounce anything on the drums. I'm not doing that. Because if you do that fast, it doesn't sound great. If you 
you stick it out, you can actually hear all the clarity. Or that's the goal, at least. So let's go to seven. I'll run through the three stickings. See? So that was singles into doubles into right, left, left. And for whatever reason, that's the order I do it in. Singles is kind of the easiest one to wrap your head around because your ear naturally doesn't hear seven, usually. It's just short of that eight, which everyone loves. Mm. Okay. Does that all make sense? I know it's kind of a lot to kind of wrap your head around, and it's difficult to try. So everybody's not have a pad and sticks, which is perfect. So the nice thing is you can play on your knees. So all the drummers, let's do this vibe. We're going to just do a group lesson real quick. That's a good tempo. So what you're going to find out, and like, it's basically all the odd numbers. So if you think about it, you've got even sticking. You have four notes, one, two, three, four. But one, two, three, if you accent three, one, two, three, one would be the second stroke of your left hand. It would be threes. Threes are actually kind of weird. Mm. Uh, mm. You would think, if you heard that, I was just going, mm. or, mm. right? So breaking up your stickings to get your hands out of what they're used to doing, just like. And it's always the crash on one, the famous crash on one. Everybody's freaked out to not do that. This will get you to play over the bar line more comfortably. You're going to start hearing phrases that aren't always just crushing the downbeat, where you can kind of maybe be a little bit more musical and maybe play with like a little longer phrasing. Does that make sense? Peter Erskine, who was nice enough to give me a really beautiful quote on the back of the book, I had a lesson with him, and he said this one thing to me. And for whatever reason, that day it just clicked. He was like, if you're walking down the street, and this is actually, it made so much sense. If you're walking down the street and you get to the little edge of a sidewalk, right, and you have green lights, you can walk, there's no traffic. When you're walking, you naturally would just take the step and keep walking. You wouldn't get to the edge, stop, look down, go, okay, there's a three inch gap. I gotta be really careful here and then I'm gonna keep walking. You just walk through it. Does that make sense? It's kind of like playing. You don't get to the last bar and go, okay, now I have to do a fill and I have to come back in on one. It's cool. If you're playing Gap Band, that stuff sounds great, right? But I don't play in the Gap Band. I wish I did, but I play different stuff. So I, all of these techniques are coming out of who I play with, typically. And playing with Charlie can go left, right, any second. You can make really drastic turns. And so having these kind of techniques really makes it a musical thing where I'm not worrying about, oh man, I gotta really put in this double paradiddle next. I mean, the last thing I'm actually thinking about is my technique and really the drums. I'm so focused on what he's playing that this kind of just disappears and I'm just trying to hook up with what he's doing. Does that make sense? And I recommend everybody try to do that, whether you're playing in a cover band or a country band or whatever. Try to get your technique, even if it's simple stuff, to the point where you're not even thinking about this stuff. You're not thinking what your technique is or how. Maybe your gig is. All right, so that's a lot harder than it seems, is to keep something locked in at like 60 BPM and be patient and not be like. Right, that doesn't feel very good. So this kind of stuff I feel like really does get you to the point if you practice it, you know, that's the other thing. If you buy the book, it won't automatically make you a better drummer. I, s I wish I could make that happen, but you actually have to practice all this stuff. So stickings make sense. Okay, everybody's probably like, that's great. That has nothing to do with playing. Aha, it does. So, if you're playing a beat, and I can take my ears off. Side note, thank you to 64 Audio. They make amazing in-ears.
So let's say you're playing. I'm not going to dive into any more of that stuff because we only have like 15 more minutes before I take questions. Is that cool? Moving on? Okay. So if you're playing like. Okay, what did I just change? Okay, and what were the doubles? Triplets. Right, so just taking, like I'm saying, a very simple thing. You kind of have this cool other thing happening with the right. Right, then you could do this, triplets, single strokes, start with your left hand. Get, see what I'm saying? So it's a single stroke roll, playing triplets, but it sounds, I don't know, more complex to me than that. The weird part is, I always started it because your left hand very rarely naturally wants to play with the bass drum. Right? So these techniques kind of, they're simple ideas, but you can kind of fool people into thinking you know what you're doing. You know what I mean? So that's why when I teach most private students, I'm like, all right, let me see your double stroke roll. And they're like, oh yeah, I got it. I'm like, no, we're gonna work on that. So having control over each. Right, just having control over your instrument. Is important, and it's not about like playing. <laughs> that to me is not super interesting. I just have no, my ear does not hear that stuff. There's amazing people that do that really well, and it blows me away. But my ear doesn't hear that stuff. I tend to play kind of more simple groove stuff because it works for the music I like. Um, does anybody have questions on this concept? Great. Uh, real quick. So does that make sense, basically? Yeah, no questions about that. Triplets with doubles. OK. There's one more exercise that I want to talk about, and everything else is in the book. You can get it later. And then I'll just play a little bit. Um, so does everybody know that exercise where you do single, double, triple, all the way up? So like four, right? So the hardest part of that to me was the, the th going from one, two, three, three, two, one, those, because it shrinks. You have very little time. So I just did those three looped. Okay, so one, two, three, one, two, one, one, two, one, two, three. So. Okay, and then loop that. Okay, the cool thing is. pretty cool groove. So it's kind of lame here. It just sounds like you're going. Right? And that's the problem. Most people are on a pad, right? Pad sounds like one thing, pretty much. And you do all these things, but you don't think about moving one other hand to a different sound. So, so now you have these kind of like melodic things happening. So like just that, you could start building an idea off of if you're going to play a solo or something, which I don't love doing. But that's what you could start with if you're stuck, you know? Or like. Just because it gives you an idea of something, something to do other than just going like. <laughs> right, which is some mornings I wake up and I'm like, man, I got nothing. I got no idea what to play. But. Let's take the, so here's a good one. This is actually a really easy one you can hear. So let's take that right, left, left sticking, okay? And I'm gonna start here, and then I'm gonna move it onto the tom so you can hear a, kind of a more melodic thing as opposed to just one sound, okay? So the sticking doesn't change. It's right, left, left. I'm gonna accent every fifth note. Kind of boring, right? So now we move it here.
So now you have these two melodies. Right, so let's... And then you can just nerd out on that for 10 minutes, right? Because you have that base of. Oh, one last thing I forgot to talk about is the foot technique part over this stuff. So you got your hands going, that's fine, right? But it's weird because it's just random accents of seven or sixes or it kind of doesn't have any context, right? So if you're doing, let's just run through fives, right? So. Now you have like kind of a groove happening and against it. So you have a contrasting background to just this. And you could really hear that as one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but it's just five, right? So, so it's looping around the pulse, you know what I'm saying? So like. So it's a, just a really easy way to get into a different headspace. Does you know what I'm saying? Okay. So that's the foot exercise. You're doing this over everything. So six, seven, ah. Uh. Okay. You go through the whole thing, then you do doubles. And each one of these is basically a little mini lesson in itself. The goal, and I called it the kaleidoscope exercise because I was sitting in my kitchen talking to my wife, and I'm like, well, it's like everything just changes with a little subtle shift, and it just kind of tweaks your playing really dramatically with a very subtle thing. And I was like, what are those? She's like, a kaleidoscope? I was like, yes, that's the name of it. And it's, you know, when you look at a kaleidoscope, does everybody know what a kaleidoscope is? I'm old, I'm 41, so. <laughs> so it's like a tube, you look through it, and I think it was like, like almost like stained glass looking kind of sand. And when you turn it just a little bit, the whole pattern, it's like a fractal changes for like a really little touch. So just going from five to six, you're moving one note, and the groove feels totally different, right? So. Uh, And depending on when you choose to switch, the accent's gonna fall in a different spot with the bass drum. If you wanna nail it right with the one, you can choose to do that, or you can just kinda go until your hands feel comfortable, switch, and they, they kinda interlock in different ways, if that makes sense to everybody. I know this is super brainiac, kinda nerdy math class, but at the end of the day, this stuff grooves, like. Or. So you get these other accents just naturally popping out. All right. So it's an easy way to get out of the box of just like. Which is nothing wrong with that. I'd be happy to play that all day. But if you're trying to get better on the instrument and you can already lock that down, this, I think, will help everybody get your hands in a little bit of a different spot. And also, more importantly, get your ear to a different spot. Yeah? Okay. I will do, does anyone have any questions on anything before I move on? And then I'll just do like a little five minute solo. Yeah. Boom. So the batter head I kind of like, you can kind of hear that papery thing. Does everybody hear that? And actually, it's the snare also, or something. Sorry, snare. There we go. 
So it's got this kind of like papery thing, which some people hate. I kind of love it. See how it went away? You get that kind of boingy. Does everybody hear that? Does everybody hear that? OK, great. Just making sure everybody's live. Now we'll really go papery. Hear the difference? I kind of love that sound. So to me, I barely tuned anything on this bass drum other than two lugs. Like it was just kind of open, medium tight tuning. This is a, a Remo ambassador on this side, the batter side. Oh, there we go. If I get close, it's louder. And on the front, I believe it's a Remo fiber skin, which I love on the bass drum. This has got a darker thing. It takes a little of that boinginess out on the front. But that, if you're playing in a band, that sounds like there's probably a pillow in it. You know what I'm saying? Like. So, and also, actually, did everybody see Keith Carlock yesterday? Jesus, that guy. So I used to see him, I, I lived in New York for a long time and I still work there. And I used to go down to the 55 bar all, like almost every Thursday that him and Wayne and Tim played. And he, he, he was the first guy I heard kind of have an open bass drum sound that wasn't playing a bebop 18 inch bass drum. And I remember just going like, man, that sounds ridiculous. And it, for now it's very hard for me to play with a pillow in my bass drum. Unless I'm doing just like a country pop thing and it needs that really pillowy sound, I have a bass drum that does that but all my other bass drums are open. It has a different feel to it. It gives you energy back, as opposed to like feeling like the bass drum is sucking in the bass drum pedal, you know what I mean? Like when you have a pillow and it's really low and it's like a thick head, it just kinda, it feels dead. This feels like it's more alive to me and makes, you know, it makes you wanna play different stuff. Like if you tune it up a little, and literally if you notice, I'm just tuning one lug, right? So now we're like in that Idris Muhammad like, kind of goes with the toms. So it's very versatile, I think. You can get that kind of open jazzy thing, but you know, in the matter of a second, you're back here. It's a pretty big difference. And I do that a lot with Charlie. Like I'll have a snare, a kick, and maybe another snare or a floor tom possibly. And I'm constantly changing my tunings. Um, does that answer your question? Nothing in it. Usually kind of thinner heads actually. My new favorite head. Um, and side note, thank you to Remo, um, Ludwig, obviously, Istanbul Agop, Earthworks Microphones, Promark. I'm going to have a stick hopefully coming out soon that really is amazing. I worked on this thing for like a year and absolutely love it. Real quick thing about the stick. I don't know if anybody can see it. I can show you if you come out. I'll be doing a signing with the book later. But it has two bit, basically two different sounds. So you can get that dark Tony. Or if you're playing more of like an open pop thing, I go kind of parallel so that all this wood is actually hitting the cymbal. You get a brighter cymbal sound. And you can hit hard. I mean, I designed them so I could play, you know, play there, or at Lion King, I literally flip them over and I'm like <laughs> It's not actually a Lion King groove, I wish it was. Um, so they're really versatile. Um, but thank you to all the companies. I mean, all of this stuff sounds, it just inspires me to play. And that's, I would just recommend whatever you play, just make sure it's inspiring what you want to hear. It's important, you know. If you got a drum kit at home you haven't really dealt with in a couple of years and it's like, eh, I don't want to play. Get something that makes you want to play. It makes a big difference, you know? Any other questions? Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. What's your name? Jeremy. Thank you. That's a really good question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, a, I don't know. Who knows me here from like Instagram and YouTube? Okay. And everybody else is like, who's this guy? <laughs> so, um, so if you watch any of that stuff, I typically don't play very hard. I mean, my kind of wheelhouse, son like sound wise, volume wise, is like. Like that to me is almost loud. You know what I mean? It doesn't take a whole lot. They're drums. It's like they're loud. You know. But to be able to like. Hard to see the drum. Like really have a range. It's cool to play the drums quietly. Like half the night when I'm playing with Charlie. Take my head off. Um, I'll be playing something like. Let's see, what's a cool sound? I mean, there's a lot you can do in this really small little range that's like more intimate. And it brings, I've seen it happen in concerts where I play these little rooms, you know, and people like lean forward as opposed to going like, whoa, that's really, that's really, really loud. I'm going to be back here. You know, and I, my goal is to bring people into the music, you know, and not just bash the whole night. To me, it gets really old really quick, and you're also just crushing everyone's ears in the audience, you know. Yeah, start low and go lower. You know what I mean? Like really make your dynamic range from the basement to the roof as opposed to like in the middle of the room. There's a lot you can do just even just with a very little bit of a touch. Like I'm literally letting go of the stick. I'm letting the weight of this thing do that. I mean, that's really quiet. You know, and like having a good press roll, have a good buzz roll. That stuff is super important, especially, I was gonna talk about this, but I could probably talk for f six hours up here. Taking a simple thing, everybody knows this, this is the first beat. It's great, let's add one, like, I don't know if you want to call this a drag, I don't know the exact. All of those little things are built off of So it's, again, having a good left hand. And if you do the exercises in the book, your left hand will get better because you have to accent these things in different spots that you're not used to doing. And check your hands. You know, press rolls are really cool, and nobody practices them typically. When I ask people to do it, they typically sound like this. Or like this. To me, it should sound like, an, like a wave or the, like, you know, like like a white noise. Like. That's not even a good one. You know? But touch is really important. It's, I mean, the only other way to really practice that is just make yourself play quiet. Pretend there's like a table having dinner around you with like a candelabra and everybody is like, extremely hard of hearing and they're terrified if you hit anything too hard. 
You know what I mean? And so if you've got to play like... Right, so like you have a way higher ceiling to go with as if you start here. Then you're just like loud to really loud, you know? And there's all this beautiful stuff happens at a very quiet dynamic on the drums. So I would recommend like getting mallets, you know, play, play with a, here, this is a perfect example. So play with a shaker, right? I, I play this tune with Charlie Hunter that was a Terrence Trent Darby tune. And I start it. Yeah, it's like here, right? And I might start like. So I try to just pretend this is some friend of mine playing this part. And if you want, you could continue the whole song. And then you could actually hit People are like, oh, did you hurt your hand? So if you hit the edge with the shaker, you can get different stuff happening. But these are all the things that I work on because I use them on gigs. You know, Everything I practice is like, all right, for a reason. I don't just sit at home and work on speed for that sake. It's just like if I needed to pull that out in a measure, it's there, and I don't have to worry about it. It's a very long answer, sorry. Yeah. Wasted? It's yeah. a good question, actually. I've never heard that one. Uh, I don't know, man. That's a tough one. I, I mean, I'm self-taught and didn't really do a lot of, like, the only book I ever worked out of was Gary Chester's New Breed, which was just, it's just a killer book. And my teacher, I was basically self-taught until, like, sophomore year in high school, and I could, like, get around the kit, but I didn't know what an eighth note was. And so... Uh, my music teacher was like, man, you really got to just know like basic note values. Like he literally wrote out this. And I was like playing to like Chick Corea electric band records or trying to. And he wrote this out. And I was like, man, I cannot play that. And he's like, no, no, he's like, you could definitely play this. He's like, you just have no idea what's going on. So that's really important. I'm not a fantastic reader by any means. And some people can just sight read unbelievable things. My brain doesn't work that way. My ears are much better. But wasted practice, man, I don't know. I feel like everything I've practiced has been fairly useful because I get pretty impatient if it's like, if I don't see the value in it very quickly or like the end result, I'm out. Because there's a million other things I know I should be working on. No, man. I, people tried to give me those books and I was like, please do not put that in my bag. Um, it's amazing, like Horacio and those dudes. I mean, the, the technical aspect of this instrument today is bonkers. I mean, watch Benny in two hours and you'll see what I'm talking about. I mean, his technique and everything is it's ridiculous. So I, I just, I, my ears don't hear that stuff. I hear much slower kind of things because that's typically what I'm playing. I mean, 90% of the stuff I'm doing with Charlie is I'll start, I could just go like <laughs> to me that grooves and like I'm I don't hear all this other stuff because why it already feels great don't you know mess with it the way I would use technique would be what I was saying earlier about listening chops like I want a different sound now like <laughs> just sonically I'm hearing different things so I'll put stuff here, I'll put this thing here, see what this sounds like. And just that will make me play totally differently than if I didn't have it. Or if I was playing on this drum, this. I'm playing whole notes over here, or half notes. Terrible music. So that's what I would be doing here. That sounds ridiculous. That's the, that's the 
most notes I'm going to probably play on that drum because it's a much longer note than this. It, that leads to that kind of a thing, you know? But I like the more Keltnery Levon thing. It's just, be it's a beautiful sound. Some people are like, oh, it's a drum, you need to tune that. That's how I tuned it. It sounds great to me, you know? Yeah. A plus. 12, 14, 20, six and a half. Uh, yeah, they sound amazing. This is the first time I've actually played this series and I'm, I'm gonna get one of these kits. They sound really good. Really nice open, they feel, that's another thing, drums all feel kind of different, even between series for whatever reason. These just, they feel like me. They feel very, very comfortable. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Yeah. New Breed, Gary Chester. That's the only book I ever did. Because I was like, ah, why am I doing like, like all these, like I was just like, this is killing me. And then you got to play, you know, all the bass drum melodies and sing and have three hi hats set up. And I was doing that when I was in high school, and my brain was falling out of my head. But I'm glad I did it because then when I had to play other things, like if I'm going to do my exercise, well, here's like one of the harder uh, parts of the book is p playing, and this is kind of maybe a subliminal Gary Chester thing that kind of made its way into how I see it now that I look at it. So the bass part of the groove is So that's like the system, right? So that's a constant. And then I do, remember how I was talking about accenting notes three through eight, right? So then you do that with your left hand. So. up to eight, and then you can change the ride pattern to like. <laughs> right, you go through the whole thing that way. That's kind of the end of the book. Um, but to me, if you check that groove out, right? just leads to that kind of thing, which I like to play that kind of stuff. Um, so it, it all has a, a musical end goal, yeah? As opposed to just like, well, let's just do this. That's boring. You know what I mean? There's no shape to that. It's just like a powerlifting competition. It's like, wow, that's really cool but doesn't fit here. You know, if I drop that, and I'm playing with Charlie and I go, he's gonna be like, please, you're fired, don't ever call me again. My favorite fills with that kind of. Just something simple that people can understand that goes with the vibe, right? I get it if you're playing like If you're playing all that kind of stuff, yeah, you can blow the chops all day, but I don't do that. I leave that up to like Zach Danzinger and those guys, you know? They just do it way better than I do, so I don't deal. Um, oh, we're over, yeah? Sorry, I, I tend to be very uh, verbose, I guess. Got time for one more question. Any qu any last question? Make it a good one if anybody has one. I got to take this one, and I'll uh, well I'll talk after. Yeah. You can write that book. <laughs> I'm not writing that book. My feet have enough trouble going like. <laughs> all that other stuff. I just might. I don't hear it that way. 
the most left thing I'm gonna do, and it's funny, when I play grooves, I just by default play the uppy. I don't know why, I think it's the New Orleans, my brother played in the Dirty Dozen Brass Band for like seven years, and I just love that kind of music anyway. So just that like. All that stuff's based on the upbeat. So that's the most independence my foot's doing, upbeats. But I will say this, this is the last thing and I'm gonna stop. Playing, just speaking of upbeats, this is a very quick way to make a groove feel up. So heavy is on the downbeat, right? If you switch to... See how much different just accenting the ups instead of the downs. It's, it's such a different feel, um, and I talk about that in a video that comes with the book. Um, just make it just a simple switch of an accent. You're not changing your sticking. Just can totally change the vibe of what you're doing, and it's simple. It's not hard. It just sounds good, you know. So that is it. I don't want to take up any more time. Thank you all so much for coming. Thank you to Sweetwater. Really appreciate everybody coming out.